Imagine a world where airplanes don't rely on fossil fuels but are powered by the very air they fly through. What if this futuristic vision is closer than you think? What if the skies over Africa are no longer defined by noise, smoke, and fuel dependency, but by silent, self-powered innovation gliding over vast lands? The story begins not in a global tech hub or billion-dollar startup incubator, but in the heart of Zimbabwe. Maxwell Chikambutso, a name now whispered with awe across the continent, dared to do what aviation giants have only dreamed about. He built a self-powered aircraft, no kerosene, no conventional engine, just pure innovation harnessing radio frequencies and advanced electromagnetic propulsion. And while most inventors would stop at one prototype, Maxwell did not. He imagined a web of sky highways stretching from Harare to Cairo. Not just aircraft, but infrastructure. Not just transport, but transformation. Africa's terrain has always been its greatest beauty and its greatest challenge. Mountains, deserts, jungles, and savannas carve the land into pieces that traditional infrastructure struggles to connect. Roads are expensive. Rail takes time. Fuel is imported. Travel is slow. And in many cases, dangerous. Maxwell understood that to connect Africa, the sky had to be claimed. But first, he had to solve the problem that grounded so many dreams, energy. That's when his team built something the world hadn't seen before. An aircraft that generates power as it moves. That stores and uses energy without relying on external fuel. That operates with a new kind of propulsion system using radio frequency converters. Aerial autonomy, but green. Sustainable, but practical. Affordable, but futuristic. And so, the aircraft flew. Quietly. Effortlessly over fields, forests, cities, and rivers. From one province to the next, the early test flights painted a picture no artist could replicate. It wasn't just about flying. It was about freeing. Freeing villages from isolation. Freeing economies from stalling. Freeing dreams from the constraints of distance. The aircraft wasn't alone. Maxwell knew success meant scale. A single aircraft could change a life, but a network could change a continent. And so began the real revolution. Strategic nodes were mapped across Africa. Not just random locations, but carefully chosen points that connected trade routes, medical centers, schools, and cultural hubs. The first node outside Zimbabwe was in Zambia, then Tanzania, then Kenya, then Ethiopia. Each new charging and control station was a beacon, a signal that the sky was no longer the limit, it was the new road. These stations didn't require massive energy supplies. They used the same RF energy technology the aircraft used. Some were powered by solar, others by Maxwell's self-powered generators. Each one built with local materials. Each one creating jobs. Engineers trained locally. Technicians hired from nearby towns. The aircraft became more than a vehicle. It became a symbol. A floating promise that tomorrow would be better. In villages like Mutoko and Karedzi, the arrival of the aircraft changed everything. Suddenly, it was possible to get medical supplies in hours, not days. Students could be flown to universities. Farmers could send their produce directly to markets hundreds of kilometers away. Tourists arrived in places where no roads existed. Hospitals received emergency patients from places that were once unreachable. Every takeoff was a liftoff for someone's future. Maxwell's team didn't stop with just one type of aircraft. Smaller drones for medical deliveries were added. Passenger craft with VTOL capabilities were tested. Cargo-only variants were deployed in mining regions, all powered by the same core innovation. Energy harvested from ambient sources. Each flight collecting data, optimizing routes, learning. AI systems managed flight paths, Weather sensors allowed smart rerouting. All of it was connected by a central sky network, Africa's first airborne logistics web. And unlike other networks, this one didn't emit CO2. It didn't require oil tankers. It didn't disrupt ecosystems. It simply worked. The aircraft, often seen as white flashes in the sky, became part of daily life. In schools, children began drawing planes with glowing panels instead of fuel engines. Entrepreneurs began using the aircraft to reach new customers. 
Doctors flew in for weekly checkups in rural areas. Artists and scholars traveled to collaborate with peers. Trade exploded across regions once economically silent. Local economies began forming around the flight paths. Markets sprang up near charging stations. Hotels opened for travelers. Workshops trained aircraft engineers. Africa wasn't just flying, it was rising. Cairo was the ultimate destination, the dream endpoint, a city of history meeting a future of innovation. The final link in the Zimbabwe to Cairo Sky Corridor would complete more than a physical route. It would complete a vision. And yet, this wasn't just about one man's idea. It was about the ripple of that idea. One spark becoming a wildfire of hope. Because when people in remote parts of Malawi saw the aircraft, they believed they mattered. When young students in Sudan watched the sky and saw technology from their continent, they dreamed bigger. When elders in Uganda touched down in places they'd only heard of, they smiled with wonder. This wasn't Silicon Valley innovation exported to Africa. It was African genius exported to the world. The aircraft stood for more than transport. It stood for independence, for ingenuity, for possibility. Proved that Africa could lead, not follow. Could innovate, not imitate. Could fly, not wait. And Maxwell, ever the quiet visionary, kept going. He refused to patent the technology in traditional ways. He made blueprints accessible to trusted innovators. He invited collaboration over competition. The project wasn't about profits, it was about progress. Each country added to the network contributed their own enhancements. Ethiopian engineers improved aerodynamic stability. Nigerian software developers built new navigation protocols. South African designers helped optimize the aircraft for high-altitude regions. It became a Pan-African achievement. One continent, one network, one sky, from Zimbabwe to Cairo. Every kilometer flown was a statement that Africa was no longer disconnected, no longer dependent, no longer delayed, but instead interconnected, self-sufficient, and accelerating. But behind the scenes, challenges brewed. Regulations weren't made for these aircraft. Some governments hesitated. Big aviation companies lobbied against the network. Fuel industries saw a threat. But Maxwell, with calm persistence, brought facts, not fights. He showed flight data. He opened up his labs. He invited inspection and oversight. And slowly, resistance turned into curiosity. Curiosity turned into collaboration. And collaboration turned into momentum. As the aircraft moved northward toward Egypt, so did the eyes of the world. Global investors wanted in. But Maxwell was careful. He wanted partners, not buyers. He protected the mission. He protected the integrity. Because the dream wasn't for sale, it was for sharing. In Nairobi, a young girl boarded the aircraft for the first time. She had never seen the ocean. Within hours, she was watching waves crash against the Tanzanian coast. That moment was the mission. Not profits. Not headlines. But impact. By the time the aircraft reached the borders of Egypt, it wasn't just the African continent watching. Scientists from Germany, Japan, and Brazil requested data on the propulsion system. Aerospace firms sent representatives to study the routes and logistics. But Maxwell wasn't interested in praise. He was interested in replication. He believed this network could not only transform Africa, but set an example for the world. Because if Africa could fly on clean energy, why couldn't everyone else? He began drafting what he called Sky Protocols, a set of open standards for any nation wishing to adopt the model. These protocols included energy architecture, air traffic design, station logistics, and even AI flight governance. Maxwell wanted every country to build, not borrow, this innovation. In Cairo, the aircraft's arrival became a moment of celebration and symbolism. The city, with its ancient pyramids, now stood at the edge of a new era of mobility. The final node of the Zimbabwe to Cairo Sky Corridor opened with music, speeches, and stories. Children who had once walked kilometers to school now traveled in minutes. Pregnant mothers in remote areas no longer feared the journey to safe hospitals. Traders moved goods across borders without waiting days for clearance or risking bad roads. And the aircraft, 
still silent, still self-powered, glided above it all. Each charging station along the route had its own story. In Lusaka, it was a woman-led cooperative that managed the hub. In Nairobi, a tech startup integrated smart sensors that tracked regional weather and optimized departures. In Addis Ababa, college students were trained as drone pilots and aircraft technicians. The network became not just about aircraft, but people. It became a training ground, a technology hub, a Pan-African showcase. The continent began to imagine new possibilities. Could the same technology power cargo fleets on rivers and lakes? Could RF energy systems be used to electrify remote homes? Could the same infrastructure support emergency response during natural disasters? The answers started to become yes, and every yes opened another door. In West Africa, Ghana began building its own network, linking up with the Zimbabwe to Cairo line. In Rwanda, drones powered by the same systems began medical delivery missions. In Botswana, a new aircraft model launched with even higher altitude capability. Maxwell's idea was growing not linearly, but exponentially. And yet, the sky wasn't always smooth. There were mechanical failures in the early days. There were land disputes over where to place stations. There were regions with political instability that delayed progress. But what amazed many was how the community responded. When a node in Darfur was damaged by conflict, locals rebuilt it within weeks. When an aircraft malfunctioned in the Congo jungle, villagers protected it until engineers arrived. The aircraft wasn't seen as property, it was seen as promise. In every corner of the continent, the skies began to hum with potential. It wasn't noise, it was movement. By now, the aircraft could be spotted regularly over Lake Victoria, the Sahara, and the Nile. From ancient landscapes to new skylines, it weaved a new tapestry of possibility. And then something unexpected happened. Smaller nations began asking to join the design team. Lesotho, Eswatini, and Djibouti all contributed improvements. In Sierra Leone, a recycled parts variant was created for disaster zones. In Togo, a hybrid amphibious version was tested for island hops. The aircraft was no longer Maxwell's alone. It belonged to the continent. And it didn't stop there. A prototype of a transcontinental variant was proposed. One that could fly from Africa to the Middle East, then to Asia, then to Europe. A vision of global corridors powered by nothing but air and innovation. But even as the aircraft flew higher and farther, Maxwell stayed grounded. He returned to Zimbabwe often. He visited schools and listened to what children imagined next. He met farmers who now sent perishable goods across borders in hours. He shook hands with elders who had once waited days for medicine. He knew the technology wasn't the end, it was the beginning. The next challenge was autonomy. Could the aircraft navigate itself entirely without ground intervention? Could stations operate without human presence? The answer again came in the form of collaboration. Developers from Tunisia and Senegal built robust AI models. Cloud-based systems ensured no flight path overlapped another. Machine learning optimized energy usage depending on altitude and temperature. The aircraft learned to fly smarter. Each trip became a lesson. Each takeoff, a test. Each landing, a legacy. It wasn't just about what was created, it was about what was made possible. Villages once considered forgotten now had flight paths. Markets once disconnected were now thriving. Tourism routes flourished in places that previously had no access. The very shape of commerce shifted. Instead of relying on mega airports, local hubs became key players. Instead of depending on foreign carriers, communities became operators. Jobs grew not only in tech, but in agriculture, education, logistics, and health. And young people, especially girls, were inspired. They saw in the aircraft something they had never seen before. A future with them in it. Piloting. Designing. Leading. One school in Malawi built its own miniature replica. Another in Sudan created a VR simulator for training. The ecosystem of imagination was now fully alive. And governments took notice. Policy began shifting. Aviation laws were rewritten. Subsidies were restructured to favor clean air travel. 
investment flowed not just in Maxwell's network but in others following his model. Aviation schools emerged with new curriculums. Trade groups formed for sharing best practices. Africa was no longer behind, it was ahead. By year five of the project, 40 nodes operated from Zimbabwe to Cairo. Over two million people had traveled on the aircraft. Goods worth billions had been moved. Emissions had been reduced by tens of thousands of tons. And perhaps most importantly, hope had multiplied. Children no longer aspired to leave their countries. They aspired to change them. Maxwell's vision had become a mirror. It showed Africa what it truly was. Capable, creative, limitless. And yet, Maxwell himself never claimed credit. He always pointed to the teams, the students, the engineers. He insisted the aircraft be open source. He encouraged competitors to do better. And soon they did. New variations emerged in Egypt and Morocco. A North African company tested solar reflective wings. An East African firm experimented with passenger drones. The ecosystem wasn't centralized, it was decentralized brilliance. Maxwell didn't fear imitation. He welcomed it. Because he knew that real innovation doesn't protect itself, it multiplies itself. It expands, adapts, and evolves. And the world began to take notice. At global summits, African air corridors became case studies. Universities included modules on RF propulsion. Climate activists pointed to the aircraft network as a model for sustainable progress. Suddenly, people stopped asking, how? And started asking, when can we join? And Maxwell's answer was always the same. Now, the sky, once a metaphor for unreachable dreams, was now infrastructure, a utility, a bridge, one that connected not just places but people. And the aircraft? Still silent, still soaring, still self-powered. From the highlands of Ethiopia to the sands of the Sahara. From the riverbanks of the Nile to the bustling cityscape of Cairo. It flew, not for luxury, not for spectacle, but for life. And beneath its wings, a continent transformed. Africa did not wait for the world to catch up. It led, it flew, changed, forever.